Well, as good as uh, where I'm a Cavs Spot season, starting. I'm a Cavs season ticket holder, so uh, I guess it sold out in like eight hours after LeBron got announced in there. So it's it's pretty cool. It's a cool thing for Cleveland. You know, we don't have we don't have much except for our river catching on fire and a couple other things. So um, Johnny, we got Johnny football, so that's good too. I mean, we're actually coming up. We got the Republican National Convention. I mean, that's huge, right? I mean. You know, I don't like any of them, but uh, you know, hey, whatever. Um, just a quick intro. Uh, I'm founder and principal security consultant at uh, Trusted Tech. I've uh, I started a few years back, um, and uh, really we've been growing leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, we started a few years ago, and we're already up to I think 22 people, which is awesome. And uh, just been growing, growing, and growing. And we just uh, hired another guy uh, locally, um, and he's starting. He's starting. Uh, he started last week. So it's been cool. And then I'm on the news a lot. Uh, I do like Fox News and CNN. And Jason Street likes to make the example that he always sees me on. Like Fox News, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, Fox News. I, I, uh, I do a lot of them. I spread them out, but uh, you know, I do different ones and, and things like that to, to kind of keep it going. But it's been fun. I'm uh, the author of the Social Engineering Toolkit, which you see a little bit of today. And I changed the topic last minute because I've given this the last talk a few times, and I haven't given this one really. And uh, the whole purpose of this one is more fun to me because it's all about uh, kind of destroying the human element and breaking into people's minds versus. You know, hey, how do we do certain things or fix certain things? So this will be a fun topic, I think, uh, to go through. I've also uh, been losing a lot of weight. I'm uh, down 80 pounds now so far, so I've been uh, working on that. It's the old me and the new me. That was uh, that's what I wear when I go on Fox News. No joke. Uh, so you can't see that. This is this is after I got recorded uh, going on Fox. Uh, this is uh, my normal attire, so I usually wear either that or no pants at all. Um, <laughs> And I'm also the sexiest man alive still. Uh, yep. If you haven't seen this, this is not Photoshop at all. This is not Photoshop. I was on the Katie Kirk show, and uh, and uh, so they're having uh, this guy named uh, Cumberpatch on, and he's uh, one of the main actors for a TV show on BBC called Sherlock, and I guess he's one of the world's sexiest men alive or something. And so it said up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive, but then they removed the up next and hovered this there for a little bit. And so and I was on the Katie Kirk show talking about some stuff, so it was perfect, uh, perfect timing, and I'm keeping that, and I love it. <laughs> I also uh, ride go to corns with uh, Jason Street. That was in Paris, and uh, that, that's not photoshopped at all. That's what happens in Paris, apparently. Okay, so uh, the agenda for today is, is going to be talking about really education awareness today. Um, if you look at what we teach our users, you know, in most cases it's, it's a pretty simplistic program because we don't want to impact. A whole bunch of time on the end users themselves, especially in big corporations. I mean, you have a big company, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 employees. Taking any time away from them is extremely costly to the organization. So it's very difficult for us in the security industry to get the right information out to the right people because you know we're taking time away from the business or people doing business. So what we've kind of geared towards, you know, in the security industry is you know pay services that send phishing examples, and then from there they do additional education, you know, and, and additional training and things like that, or online CBTs and things like that, that, that are trying to train the users on just the basics. Because we are really just trying to teach the basic story users, because having 20,000 sensors in your environment is much better than having none, right? So at least having a basic knowledge of things to look for, predefined patterns of things that attackers typically use, just to give them a basic sense is important. And the reason why it's important is because in today's society, I mean, we've, we've really heightened our security on the perimeter devices. Would you say that's an accurate statement? I mean, we've got firewalls and next generation firewalls and intrusion prevention systems and web application firewalls and HANA virus, which I'll talk about. But, uh, you know, uh, you have all these things that we have to protect our systems on the perimeter devices. So us as attackers, we move and shift to what's the easiest. And by far the easiest is the user, right? And our endpoints. Right? Because we still don't know what we're doing on our endpoints right now. I mean, we may have HIPS installed, or we may have, you know, application whitelisting, which I'll talk about that too. We might have all these technologies at endpoints, but for us as attackers, that doesn't really stop us. Because the end user will always do something in order to give us information. And what's great about it, um, and I'll, sh I'll show you an example of this really quick. Uh, has anybody seen my Katie Kirk interview before in the past? We have like one or two, it's good. So targeting one individual is actually much more difficult than targeting 500 people. Because 500 people, you mess up on one, you just move to the next one, right? And you just change your pretext to something that's going to work. There's, there's so many great examples. Like uh, I was doing a, a social engineer one time for an organization, and just by calling their help desk, it's like press one if you're having issues with your mainframe password, or this, or this, or you know you have trouble with Exchange, or I mean, it gave me all the information on the help desk, you know, the automated thing. 
It's great. It's like, okay, now I know you exchange, you have a mainframe here, so you know that stuff. Now I can start focusing on my pretext of getting those passwords. And so, you know, when I started probing, I'm like, okay, hey, you know, they, all they asked for a, uh, for a challenge question is the uh, birthday. How hard is it to get a birthday? Pretty easy. So, you know, from there, it's easy to then reset passwords or get access to passwords or whatever you need to do in order to do it. And so, so our human link will always be the weakest because, it's, you know, we always anticipate people to be good. We always anticipate people to have good intentions. That's just the society we have. <clears throat> we talk about accents, too. I'm horrible at accents. So we have uh, one of our guys, Rick Hayes, has a southern accent. Um, he's, he's from Atlanta, Georgia, but he's got kind of like the southern twang type, type accent. Probably kill me for saying that, by the way. But, um, you know, he's great because people trust the southern type, type twang accents more than they do someone that's from, like, from Cleveland, for example. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that go into this, and I'll talk about that. And, and really, my focus is going to be what we're taught today and destroying everything we're taught. So I'll be defeating everything that we're taught in our education awareness. Like my favorite one by far is the hover. Everybody heard about the hover? You know, it's like, hey, if you get an email or a link or whatever, you have to hover over it, right? Because a hover is going to show whether or not it's legit. Well, we're going to defeat that today, and we're going to destroy that. It really sucks, by the way, because there's no real way of fixing it. And I didn't think about that when I published it, but anyways. <laughs> Sorry. So how we had today. So starting off, you know, I'm going to walk through what we're taught, walk through what really works, and we're just going to jack some stuff up. And then I'm going to talk about how you fix it long term, okay? Because, you know, the, the one I'm going to show you, or the couple I'm going to show you, it's very hard to protect against. But at the same time, there are ways of protecting against it as long as we have multiple layers of security. All right? And you're going to hear that, right? We've already heard defense in depth. We've heard it since like 1992, right? It's, it's like not a new concept. But we still don't do it. Like for example, are all of our users on their own individual segments that they only have access to what information they need on their internal network? No, right? But that's like a 1992 concept. Still don't do it today, but it's okay. We'll talk about that, all right? So today's SE phishing. You know, we're supposed to send hundreds of emails. Um, you know, sometimes people like to do missed gongs because they don't want to impact the business. Phishing, by the way, if, if a company's never done it, is a very, very political engagement within an organization. I mean, people get pissed. Part of my language, there's going to be a couple of probably swear words that I throw out here, but people get mad at when you do phishing inside of organizations. They feel like they're being targeted. They feel like they're being singled out. And that's not the intent. And, and we have to be really careful when you do these in organizations because the intent isn't to make people, people feel embarrassed. It's to test how effective your education awareness is and how your controls are. You know, are your you know, perimeter devices, are your e is your egress filtering, your content filtering, is your endpoint protection stuff, is that working first? Is our technology piece, the function that, that we provide as a service to our business, working? And on top of that, do our users know to report something? And, and do they know who to go to? Do they know how to respond to things that, that happen within an organization? Those are two distinctly important things within an overall education awareness program, the technology and the people. And you're not looking for a 100% clip in this in any way, shape, or form. You just want one person to say, hey, this doesn't look legit. And then from there, you triage and figure out what the heck happened, right? You just need one person in your entire organization that got targeted by this one right here, or whatever it ends up being, to do it. Now, what's interesting about you know, this stuff right here, we send out hundreds of emails, and we do sampling and sample sizes and things like that. This does not simulate what an attacker is going to do at all. This is completely different than what we're going to see in the wild, 100%. So is this accurate of how we're training our users right now? No. I mean, I. I Maybe you're going to get a misspelled, you know, you know, Nigerian scam type thing where it's a Nigerian prince, and I fell for that like five times. I keep, I keep trying to figure out when I'm going to get the money. Um, but you know, most of the cases, if you're being targeted, you know, by, as an organization, I'm not saying APTs or things like that, or you know. And by the way, the, it's funny because like all the APT stuff cracks me up because everybody's like trying to protect against APTs and APTs. If you look at, if, has anybody actually watched the video of the APT one stuff from India? It literally looks out of like a 1980s movie. Like, they're not using anything sophisticated at all. They're, they're not doing, like, reconnaissance or doing OSINs or anything that we talk about all the time. They're just like, hey, I'm just going to craft this really stupid email, and then people are going to click on it anyway. And they don't have to do anything different because we all fall for it. So it's like nothing sophisticated. APT stuff isn't like O-Days coming off the yin-yang. People don't burn O-Days on you because they want to. It's like, hey, send something stupid, and then people are going to click on it. So this isn't, an, this isn't a, an accurate portrayal of what we're doing today. And the automated email stuff, you know, it's good to do a reoccurring awareness, don't get me wrong. It's important. But at the same time, the automated email stuff is training our users to be very methodical in how they look at things. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you start doing that over and over and over again, you become accustomed and tuned to it and it becomes a problem. I'll talk about that. 
So a real world example, if I'm an attacker, all right, I'm going after a small subset of users. And the reason I'm going for a small subset of users is why? Why am I gonna go after a small subset of users? You know why? You can fool some of the people all the time? I can fool some of the people all the time, right. So lower, lower probability of being detected, correct? The lower number of people you send emails to or target or fish, the lower probability you have of being detected. And I just, I just have to be patient. Like, we want shells right away. If I send it to three people, you might wait an hour. It's about all you're gonna wait. We might wait, so go, go get, you know, go do something else, code something else, or do something. Come back and check to see if you got shells, no shells. Okay, come back, wait. If you don't get anything after an hour, send a couple more out. One of the ones I did recently um, was a, was a pretty funny use case. Um, the company was celebrating a hundred year anniversary, and it's a manufacturing company, and they're you know American and all this other stuff, and you know so they're selling a, you know uh, they're, they're celebrating this hundred year anniversary. What was great about it is they posted all over the website. It was like you know the website was redesigned, they had press releases, and all this. It's perfect, right? That is a perfect pretext for me as an attacker. Like, thank you. You couldn't get any better. So what I do is I go to their, their blog, and I see the contact person, the PR uh, individual, and I email her. And I send her an email, and I say, hey, congratulations on 100 years of success. I'm from mediaprnews.com, you know, registered domain or whatever. And you're like, I'd like to do a story on you folks. Would you be interested? And she's like, you know, literally, as soon as I hit send, I get a response back. It's like almost instant, right? And so that one email, what does that one email do for me? Does anybody know that one email when she sends it back to me? Don't think technicals is all. Foot in the door. Foot in the door, Credibility. absolutely. Credibility signatures, perfect. So how do they sign their emails? Like, right, colors, the phone numbers, the emails, everything, right? So now you know the structure of the company, which is, you know, just took me two seconds. Like, hey, went to their website, went to their blog, cool, all done. Now all of a sudden I, 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 I developed this pretext, and it was a really weak pretext, I'm not gonna lie, it's one of my worst ones that I've done. Um, but it, was still, it still worked, I mean, like, amazingly, surprisingly, but I'll say that in a second. So I, I, I come up with this email saying, hey, it's a 100-year anniversary, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spoof my, my name coming from this PR person, I'm gonna send it to a couple targeted people within the organization, mostly R&D, you know, a few of the sales folks, because they click on anything you want them to. Um, and so I'm gonna send it to a couple of these guys just to ensure I have a high success rate, right? And so I send it to these two, or it was like three or four people, and all of a sudden, I start getting a million shells coming back. And, and the thing was, the funny part was, I sent them a PDF, you know, like a you know, PDF, you're like, oh, hey, the PDF must be malicious, whatever. No, it was a legit PDF that had a fake press release in it saying, hey, we're giving away free, 100 free iPhones, you know, to the first 100 people because we're so excited about our 100-year anniversary and we want to reward our employees and blah, blah, blah. This was a legit press release. No, no malicious content whatsoever in that PDF. Now, as soon as they clicked on the website to register for the iPhone, I harvested credentials and I jacked the computer and that shells, right? Evil thing to do, but it worked. So I get shells and then I get like two or three back and all of a sudden I start seeing like a million coming back. Like I'm getting flooded with shells and I'm like, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Did I send it to the wrong people? And I started forwarding it to their friends inside the company because they're all excited and they're like, I didn't get this. And all of a sudden I got like 300 shells coming back. I'm like, oh no. So you gotta be careful on the different ones you do. Um, now a funny part about that one specifically was uh, when, I, when I compromised them and I had shells, they did actually a really good job on a defense and depth strategy. So they had application one of this thing, which I bypassed, and I'll talk about that. Then they had, um, you know, all of their users are regular user accounts, which is a good practice. So if they're regular user accounts, what can I do for privilege escalation? Well, I can probably try, you know, bypass UAC or maybe, you know, a couple of privilege escalation techniques, or I can try piggybacking like GPP or a couple other ways of getting access to it, but it becomes more difficult. Now, I sent this fish out about one o'clock, which is what, my mistake. I should have did it earlier in the day. And so I sent it at one o'clock. By three or four o'clock, I didn't have persistence. So I didn't have maintained access into the network. So I had 300 shells, but what starts happening around four or five o'clock? People shut down and go home, right? So I start seeing shells dying. I'm like, oh no. And so they're dying. I'm like, well, I'm gonna have to do a whole other pretext again, or I can be creative. So I call this one dude up, and the, I had a shell from his computer, and I, you know, obviously I can see who his name is and everything. I had access to all their emails. So I can look at the gal, and inside the gal, I had the phone numbers there. So I call this guy up. I spoof my phone number coming from, from the help desk, and I call this guy up, and I say, hey, Bob, Bob, I just want to let you know that that whole you know iPhone thing was was total BS. It was it, it was it was a hacker trying to break into your computer. Uh, it wasn't legit, but we're here to help you clean it up. And he's like, it's like, dang it! I knew this company would, was too cheap. They wouldn't give me a free iPhone. This place sucks. I'm like, whoa, 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 Bob. It's okay, man. I understand. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and and fix your computer for you. So if you notice some weird things moving around your computer, it's just me messing around. Okay? He's like, all right, fine. I'll leave it on, whatever. So then I spoof my phone number from Bob's phone, call the help desk. I say, hey, I'm Bob. I just, I was trying to open up Office, and I'm getting this kernel 729 memory porn instruction flaw. I, I'm like, listen, dude, I, I barely know how to hit the start menu. Can you please remote my computer and fix it real quick? And so, you know, the help desk logs in, 
And they, they open up Word and it works fine. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are saviors. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for fixing my computer. And you guys are, oh, yeah, man, of course, cool. I'm happy to help out. You know, I'm like, I'm going to tell your manager you did an awesome job. Thank you. Click. You know, so I didn't raise any suspicions. And what happens when that help desk admin logs into a machine? Creds and memory, you know, Kerberos tokens, you know, uh, some impersonation of Kerberos tokens. Now I'm an admin. Now I got persistence. So just come some fun ways of doing real world scenarios, right? That one was pretty bad. Oh, another one in this one is uh, one of the ladies actually emailed me, and she was like, I, you know, she's like, this company is so awesome. She's like, my daughter has cancer, and I'm gonna give her this iPhone. It's gonna make her day. And I'm like, oh. So I went on and bought an iPhone and I sent it to her. So I, <laughs> well, I'm not even messing with that. God's gonna get me afterwards. So, you know? uh, so social engineering training. Um, usually it's like online CBT training. You know, uh, boring as heck. Maybe one day training session. And I apologize if it's offensive. It's kind of intended to be that way a little bit. But uh, maybe use a third party to fish you or whatnot. Um, but really, that's kind of what our education awareness program is today. It's just, hey, we're gonna give our users a one hour training session, then we might send up with some phishing emails or some sort of things, or maybe a one day training session, whatever. And what's interesting is I, I came from, I was a chief security officer for Diebel. All right, so I ran the security program, I had a team, I had an education awareness program, I had all this other stuff, and we still had that one hour boring CBT thing. And what did I do being the chief security officer of a Fortune 1000 company when I had to take that training? Next, 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 finish, done for the next year. That was it. And if I'm doing that as a chief security officer, everybody else is too. That's what your online training is. It's nothing. You may put like time breaks in there. We're very creative on the time break stuff. We're like, next, okay, we'll do some stuff over here. Oh, I'm good, okay, yeah, next. And then, you know, so, you know, the, the online training stuff is interesting because, you know, it's, it's really, you know, really, really boring. So if you look at real, uh, real world testing training, listen, in order to, to actually test a company, you have to know how effective you are on your controls, okay? You need to figure out, is your technology working? Is your education working? And then part of that is continuing to build up on education. It's not just like, hey, I'm gonna slam a one year, you know, once a year type training session. I'm gonna actually focus on teaching people things. So I always like, you know, like, the target breach was a perfect example, or a heart bleed, or these issues that happen in the, in, the, in, the, in the news. Those are great opportunities for us to relate to somebody inside the company on a security issue that impacts them personally. If you can impact somebody personally in their environment, you've done a good job because they're gonna remember that. So like what I like to do with online, uh, with education awareness training is I'll be like, hey, how do you secure Facebook? Right, Not from your kids, you know, protect your kids. How do you secure your wireless stuff? How do you know if someone's hacking your home computer? What are free tools that you can use to protect yourself? And I'll talk about one called Emmet here in a little bit, which is a phenomenal tool, ways of bypassing it, but I'll talk about that too. Um, but it's a phenomenal tool to help out on, on, on protecting us, your days, things like that. Stuff like that resonates with people. And what was interesting, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but once you have a culture that actually listens to you on security, doing security related efforts in your organization, like things that dynamically change how people have to use their computers, makes sense to them. Like, hey, we're gonna implement like two-factor authentication. Cool, did it in a week in a Fortune 1000 company. Or hey, we're implementing NAC. Cool, did that in two months in a Fortune 1000 company. You know, those things start to work fast and people don't get pissed because they start to realize what you're doing. You're trying to protect them. And that's a different mindset from what we're doing with this stuff. Completely different. All right, so uh, today's equipment drops. I love the equipment drop ones we do for testing. This is so 1997-ish, the USB drops. Do we have USBs in 1997? I think we did, right? Yeah. Yeah, we did. They're expensive, yeah. USB one. Yeah, USB one, there we go. So we had USB drops, and, and you know, and this is the, the thing that we tell how to test, you know, whether or not people are gonna pick something up that says confidential HR data and plug it in their computer, and then we're gonna hack them, right? Auto run's been disabled for like ever. Right? Most company does anybody still have auto run enabled in their company? No. So now you have to get somebody to like like double click on something or, or you know run an executable or something like that's gonna be pretty glaring. This stuff, I mean, I don't know, maybe it still works. But to me, it doesn't. I think it's you know definitely dated. And we start looking at uh, real world scenarios of equipment. My favorite um, way of pen testing a company is not through phishing. Do you believe that? The author of the social engineering tool gets us. Phishing isn't the number one thing, right? It's not. It's by far the coolest thing you could ever possibly do in your life. People will believe whatever you send to them, no matter what. You make that thing look legit. 
make it, you know, put a nice little cover letter of the company you're going after. One of my favorite ones, and I've talked about this a couple times before, but as uh, I sent, uh, uh, we're targeting a company, and uh, Adrian probably knows a lot of this stuff here, but it's a uh, Adreno device, a, you know, like a, a, a Tenzi device. Anybody ever seen a Tenzi's? Okay, so it's a little microcontroller. And what we did is we uh, disassembled a uh, keyboard, and we put a, uh, a USB uh, repeater in there, as well as a uh, Adreno device that mimics a keyboard, okay? And so we sent that we packed them these things. These are the coolest like uh, uh, keyboards you can buy. It's like 300 bucks. They have the backlits and the LEDs that hook, hook up to iTunes and all sorts of crazy stuff, right? And we sent it to like three of the IT guys saying, "Hey, we'd like to like to send these out to all of our IT guys um, to see if it would be if it'd be beneficial for you to use these type of things for productivity." Put a letterhead on it and everything, and from the company sent it out to them. And what happened is, is it, it waited for a um, control of lead sequence, okay? And they would capture the control of lead sequence. So you know, username, Bob, password, whatever. Right, which is used like summer 2013 or summer 2014 or something like that. Anyway, um, yeah, you guys have to change your password for this. But um, so we so we did this, and which the control lead sequence, username, and password, you log in, right? And then it just sits there and waits for like seven or eight hours. So it waits for seven or eight hours, and then what happens? Jiggles the keyboard a little bit, make sure it wakes it up from sleep, and then it hits control to leave because it's emulating a keyboard. It hits control to leave, it types the username and password, then types in a PowerShell backdoor. So then it's all memory resident, and I get a shell out of the computer, and it was all legit. People have no idea what you can do with just mail delivery systems. It's amazing. You can tell people to do whatever you want to. You can be like, listen, I'm going to infect your computer with a piece of malicious code. It's going to exploit your machine and give it to bad hackers, but it's okay because it's not a letterhead. They will do it. <laughs> it's okay because it came from the mail system. As long as you tell them it's okay, it's fine. Do whatever you want to there. I love this part. This is my favorite. Because you don't have to worry about pretexting. You can just come up with whatever you want to, and as long as you send it to the mail, it works. It's great. Today's SE in person. Uh, we might impersonate a delivery person, which is fun, by the way. Um, you know, impersonating delivery people, things like that, impersonating employees, piggybacking. The funny part is you don't do any crazy stuff. Like when it comes to like breaking in, no one's gonna be like James Bond. Like we always like we're computer nerds, right? And so we like to think that we're like these these crazy guys that like leap through buildings and like climb fences and lockpick doors and like we're like Mission Impossible stuff, right? We got the we got the gear and everything with like the radio and like we're we're like ready to go throat mics, you know, we're we're hopping in, we're like we're breaking in, we're hacking into computer systems. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Like literally, I, I was doing an assessment for a major retail chain, huge, right? And what I did is I walked into the store, like dressed like this, okay? I walk up to a register, I take the register, and I walk out of the store. <laughs> And I put it in my car and I drive off. <laughs> I know that's Mission Impossible. That's some crazy stuff there. Like I, the real story was I was hanging from the roof with a with a with a rope and I was coming like that and I grabbed it and I lifted myself back up again. No one could see me and I got to the window and then I walk in. You take the damn thing. You walk out. There's money in there. There's like a whole bunch of money. I don't know what to do. I'm like, oh crap. There's really money in there. I call my I call my partner. I'm like, hey, I just stole a whole bunch of money. Can you please make sure I don't get in trouble? So you gotta be careful about that because there's really money in there. Um, or this, uh, we went to another, another same, same customer, went to another store, walk in, and the server room, you know, is in the back by the employee section. What do I do? I'm really bad at laughing, it's gonna take a little while. <laughs> Grab the server room. <laughs> people don't care. As long as you look like you're supposed to belong, people do not care. I mean, you can do whatever you want to as long as you don't raise suspicion. Like the Proxmark. Have you seen the Proxmark before? You can clone badges on it. You actually have to literally be like touching somebody. That's why I hug all the time. I'm actually cloning your badges. But uh, <laughs> Proxmarks are interesting because you actually have to, you know, go up to somebody and you have to like literally like hop a feel with them. You're like, hey, what's up? Go up to a stranger like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> How you doing? Yeah. Oh, hang on a second. It didn't turn green yet. Hang on. Okay, it's green. We're good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Proxmark, you don't need to do that. Like, just walk into a building. Best, best is like this. Okay, if, I, if, I, if I'm in a suit and tie, and I'm on the phone, is anybody going to stop me? Not one person. The security guard won't stop you because you look important, right? My favorite is um, I'll wait for um, this. This is going to sound horrible. So if you drive a beater car, I apologize. But you know, you look for somebody for with, that comes in with like a beater car, and, like just the car that's like got the, the the muffler hanging off and it's like shooting sparks and stuff. You wait for that person, and you come with the suit and tie. And like, oh hey, what was your name again? Oh yeah, hey, um, you know, I see all the hard work you do. Thank you so much. And then you just walk in with them, and you're talking to them. Like, what's up, dude? Come here, man. You can do whatever you want to. There's so many different scenarios. You don't have to do anything sophisticated. There's nothing you need to do that's like crazy, hopping through walls and lobbing. 
I mean, we're not, don't get me wrong, I've done those before, and those are fun. You know, breaking into banks and stuff like that at night. There's no point in it. Is that something an attacker is really going to do? Let me get my clicker. That's not fun, that's my clicker. <laughs> All right, so what we teach our users? Um, users are talking on the phone, don't provide sensitive information. The funny part is, do you know what users consider sensitive information? What do users consider sensitive information? Their personal stuff, right? Hey, if you ask for a social security number, you better well have a dang good pretext because they're not going to give that up, right? Or their birth dates or things. The birth dates are pretty easy. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to what users consider personal information, it is not intellectual property. They do not consider what they're working on as intellectual property that make you unique as a company. So what's interesting about this is that you can literally call and ask for all of the recipes. Like, Hey, let's just say they're, they're a, a manufacturer and they're, you know, they're, they're, their core service is this, this chemical compound that builds this product. You could call up like one of the R&D guys, like, hey, what's your chemical compound for this product? I'm like a sales guy that's trying to deal with it. He's like, yeah, dude, it's like equals two to the power, whatever, you know. They'll give you whatever you want to, as long as it doesn't trigger their radar on it. My favorite is caller ID checks. You know how easy it is to spoof caller IDs? Ridiculous, right? You can go to your app store now and look up like spoof apps. And you can call. Like we, we always, uh, one of our, uh, one of our guys, Scott, gets really agitated when you call him and like just try, try to play with him. So we call him and spoof him from like all of his family members, and then like, we have like dogs barking in the background, like police sirens and stuff. So you can do whatever you want to in these things. It's great. Anything set suspicious, you got to be, you got to play the role. You got to be confident. You can't be, you know, super nervous and things like that. Uh, we did one recently where, where uh, we spoofed our phone number coming from their corporate headquarters uh, to one of these these retail store locations. And uh, you know, we, we basically did a, um, a lot of reconnaissance on one of their project managers for IT. And so I called, I spoke to them and said, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a, I'm a project manager from IT, blah, 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 blah. I'll be sending you a confirmation email just letting you know these two guys are coming on site, asking for you know, their cards, their consultants, asking for their cards. I didn't have to do new cards. Like, I just gave my trusted site card. You know, like, hey, just letting you know. And, and so when you walk in, like, hey, I'm so-and-so, um, you know, James should have told you yesterday that I'm coming in. Oh, yeah, cool, come on in, here you go. Here's access to everything you need. Cool, easy to do. Uh, phone spoofing, like literally, phone spoofing, my six-year-old son can do it. He has done it to me. It's kind of weird, actually. Um, it can be used in any company. Uh, you know, be careful on friends. One time we did a, uh, so we piggybacked into this one company, right? And we get inside, and we're at this conference room. We, we were, like, looking for rooms that are open, so we're in this conference room. And I call from the conference room, right? I'm inside this conference room, and what we're trying to do is one of our bogeys was to get access to the data center and, and hack the data center. So I call, and I'm like, hey, you know, James, this is so-and-so, you know, from, from security. Hey, I, just, I have three guys coming down, you know, can you sign them in and, and, and just let them, you know, into the back of the data center area? And he's like, you know, uh, you know I'm best friends with the guy you're claiming to be, right? I'm like, quick, and we like ran out of the building, right? You know, so you gotta be careful on who you spoofing a person in because if they're best friends, it doesn't work so well. Uh, users talk to Hover, I'll talk about the Hover in a second. Uh, and we'll, 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 uh, the hover's my favorite one because you're like, hey, verify the link that you're going to because it's got to be legit, right? It's got to be good because you hover over it and it says, hey, it's a legit domain, everything, it's got to be good, right? How am I going to defeat that? I mean, no. Nope. There's nothing to do with that. Copy the URL. That, that would work. Yeah. Internationalized domain name. Nope. So here's that version uh, 604, which uh, I released, I think, last week. Um, What's funny is, uh, anyway, I'll do the whole story. I'll call it. But, um, set, six out of four was released last week. If you're not familiar with SEP, the Social Engineering Toolkit, it's open source, it's free. Um, it's something that I do just as a side project when I'm on the airplanes and at night and two in the morning. And uh, really, what it's, it's supposed to be is a way for you to be able to pretty much bypass any preventative measure that you have to test if your if technology is working. So, two of the examples I'm going to show you. The first one is the Job App, which was kind of like the flagship product in SEP, which works. The, the, um, the Job Apple Attack, what's nice about that one, is it doesn't take advantage of any actual exploit. So just by design, Java sucks. And so since Java sucks, you can use it to, to basically do whatever you want to. So even if you're using the most up-to-date version of Java, it doesn't matter, which is why this is so successful. And the best part about it is it bypasses application whitelisting, antivirus, you know. Um, how do I reveal them without not revealing them? Uh, perimeter, virtualized defenses. That's the right word. Um, so you, it gets rid of all of those. So you don't really have to worry about those barriers, and you get shells coming out of the network, which is nice. Uh, but more than this is just a tool. I mean, if you don't know how to use a tool, and you don't do your proper reconnaissance, 
then you're just setting yourself up for failure. So when you use this tool, you got to do the proper research, you got to do the proper open source intelligence, because that's the most important piece of all of this. You can be whoever you want to be in social engineering. You can be Bob, you can be Jane, you can be Rick, you can be whoever you want to be, as long as you do your proper OSINT, your open source intelligence, doing reconnaissance on the company. What's great about reconnaissance is like everybody posts everything with social media and everything else. Does anybody here have a LinkedIn account? Of course we all do, right? Does anybody post like the types of technology that they're really good at? Thank you, all right? So it's like, hey, I work for Bank X, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm the you know, FireEye administrator, we have Symantec, we have ArcSight, but we just put ArcSight in, thank you. Now I know you're monitoring detection for the week, right? So giving me enough information on LinkedIn about the technology you use helps me a ton on profiling what technology you have to get around as an attacker. So you do your proper reconnaissance, you should have a dossier and a company that makes it so friggin' easy to compromise them, like literally my six-year-old can do, right? Just by doing the research, that's all you need. And so here's a couple of demos I'll show you. Adrian hates when I'm on stage because I move around all the time. I do it more and more when I know he's recording me. <laughs> I got plans for an Arduino device that has a motion detector to follow people. <laughs> of course you do. So here's a Windows 8 machine, right? Because uh, Windows 8 is much more secure. And I got ABG running um, with Emmet. So, um, so you know, ABG, it doesn't matter what antivirus company is, we don't know. Does anybody know the detection ratio right now for antivirus? Two to four percent of, of actually detecting uh, malware. So the antivirus you have in there is detecting maybe two percent. And that thing, I think that's really generous. I think that's a, kind of like a, they're like, they wanted to throw a couple percentage in it and make sure it wasn't like negative two. Um, so as far as detecting malware, getting around antivirus is ridiculously, ridiculously easy. Just as easy as it possibly gets. And including that, like you start adding like, the endpoint protection stuff, it's even easier. Like it just got, for some reason, it's gotten so much easier for us as attackers to get around that stuff. I don't know, right? Anyways, so this is a fully up to date, you know, Windows 8 machine with uh, Emmet Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, which we'll talk about. Um, it's running the latest version of Java, okay? So we should be good, right? We have what we would normally have. We have endpoint protection, we have antivirus, and you can have like Fit9 or application like this thing here too, that's fine, it's no big deal. We're gonna get around that too. Um, and you have all this stuff on here, right? And on top of it, you have things like egress filtering, right? So you only allow like 80 and 4 3, but they're proxy and you're doing SSL termination and all that. We'll get around that too. Um, and then you have things like, you know, a blue coat or a scan safe. Like, we'll get around that too. So just, just wait. So what I would do in this scenario, in the new version of the toolkit, um, what happened is the antivirus vendors, the reason why they die off so quickly is, is they, they are predominantly signature-based, right? And so a lot of them have moved to different types of technology, like uh, behavior analysis, network analysis, stuff like that, to try to prevent it a little bit more. Like, uh, I know, uh, was it uh, uh, Trends, uh, was it Deep Inspector, or something like that? Um, does a little bit more than just antivirus signatures. It actually looks at packets, um, some portions of memory a little bit, some API hooks. They're getting a little more complex. The problem you have with antivirus is a signature. So what they do is, you know, as soon as you write, you know, something, if someone's seen it in the wild, they write a signature off of it. And now there's millions and millions and millions of people spitting out code every single day. There's no way for them to keep up with it. So when, when I really set, they started writing uh, signatures for my, my, my uh, in very early stages, my binary droppers. And so I removed um, from doing binary droppers and just reside purely in memory, so I never touched it. So then I'm like, okay, well, we're going to write signatures for your jar files because your jar files can be malicious. So what I do now is anytime you go to GitHub, and you do a git pull, every five minutes is a brand new jar that's completely dynamically obfuscated, polymorphic with encrypted AES keys every time. So there's no, I haven't been caught for like five years now or four years now. So you don't have to worry about ever being flagged. And what's nice about the, the new method in set is it does predictive analysis and how effective it can, it can compromise the system. So if it sees that it's Windows 7, it'll try multiple methods of exploitation until it finds a successful one. So for example, my favorite one, anybody, is anybody here still on Windows XP? Have some Windows XP? It's okay, I'm not even going to embarrass you. You're actually more secure than those that moved to Windows 7. You know what happened when you moved to Windows 7? This awesome thing called PowerShell. Thank you so much from the hacker community. Now, don't get me wrong, PowerShell is amazing. It's, it's functionally, it's, it's phenomenal. It gives us an avenue that we never had before on the sysadmin side. And the guys that develop it are friggin' brilliant. Um, but what it also does is it gives us a reliable exploitation method that we never had before. 
And the problem with it is that there's nothing you can really do aside from what's called app blocker, and I'll talk about that, to restrict access to it. So a PowerShell, even if it's the most restrictive form, which is, I believe, all sign, you can bypass what's called execution restriction policies. I did a talk at DEF CON like 16 or 17 when PowerShell beta was out. And I showed how you can bypass with another guy, Josh Kelly, how you can bypass execution restriction policies. And it's super easy. I don't think it's anything, anything crazy. You just take your, your, uh, your code, you cast the unit code, then you basically form code, and then you pass in a coding command argument, and then boom, you bypass execution restriction policies. And you can write whatever you want to. Now, a guy named Matthew Graver came out with a phenomenal attack in PowerShell that allows you to inject um, straight up shell code into memory. So what you can use is you can use PowerShell, bypass execution restriction policies, and inject all your shellcode memory without ever touching disk. So that's bad because PowerShell is what? A whitelisted application? Is it suspicious? No, right? So now I got an, a whitelisted application, which I never understood application whitelisting in the first place. Like, it just blew my mind that we all went to the application whitelisting room because like, as an attacker, if I'm targeting your, your endpoints, which is where Bitman's gonna be installed at, right? What am I going to attack? Already whitelisted processes. I'm going to exploit Java or IE or Adobe or whatever. Those are already whitelisted. It doesn't, like those, there's times where I'm breaking into customers and I'm like, hey, did their application whitelisting thing stop you? I'm like, oh, you guys, you guys had application whitelisting? So yeah, uh, yeah, it was really, really difficult. Yeah, hard. Yeah. I never understood the movement for that. So anyways, so PowerShell is going to be a whitelisted application. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, we can get unfiltered, um, you know, memory act, um, uh, remote code execution through PowerShell without having to really worry about it. And set takes uh, part of that. So the first exploitation method it tries is it detects to see if PowerShell is enabled. If PowerShell is enabled, it does the exploitation method and then injects Metasploit shellcode or whatever you kind of shellcode you want to directly into memory, and then from there compromise your machine. Now, what's great about most of the payloads is they're proxy aware. So if you're using HTTP or HTTPS proxies, it's going to use RSC compliant HTTP and HTTPS communications. And it's going to be proxy where because what? They had to go to a website to get to yours, right? So they're already authenticated. And it hooks into those IE settings, and then boom, it rides over your trusted connection over RFC compliant HTTPS and HTTP. Perfect. Works out for us because you can't see anything. It's all legitimate HTTP traffic. Now, one caveat, I don't know if you know this or not, but Metasploit, has anybody ever actually looked at a packet capture of how Metasploit actually works with the HTTP and HTTPS module? Metriper? You may know what actually happens there. So Metasploit, you have what's called a first stage and a second stage, okay? First stage is just the basic downloader. It just goes and downloads whatever. In the HTTP and HTTPS module, that downloader actually you know, uses an uh, HTTP request to get off the website, and it actually downloads an executable, a PE file. Now, what's the problem with that? Content filters. Content filters don't allow you to download an executable. At least most hopefully shouldn't. So there's ways of getting around that um, with Metasploit. There's a few different ways. The first one is there's a, an advanced option in Metasploit called enable stage encoding. Enable stage encoding uses what's called Shikata A, which gets picked up on a file level. It doesn't get picked up on the network level, which is great. Shikata A mangles the PE file so that you're not downloading a PE file anymore. You're just downloading an encoded blob of data that's via HTTP and HTTPS. It gets around your content filters, which is really nice. Or you can do a couple other techniques. Uh, right? Like I did a DEF CON presentation last year on uh, writing over. So I took an HTTP request and I tunneled it over SSH, over HTTP, and then used that as a, basically a tunnel into the network and not getting detected. Yep. So encoding to me is, is kind of a dead art. Uh, the, the encoding on Metasploit is, is done. There's, no, there's nothing you're going to be able to use inside a pre canned Metasploit module like MSF Encoder or MSF Venom that's going to be, um, not get picked up by most of the antivirus or traditional um, HIPS products that are out there. So MSF Venom's dead. Veil has some good stuff in it. So interesting enough, um, well, like Veil's expanded way beyond what I did um, back in the day. So um, what I originally came out with about, I don't know, five years ago was a way of taking Python code and then using it to bike compile it into a binary. So you had your code with the interpreter wrapped inside of it. And that's been a reliable exploitation method for the longest time to get around uh, antivirus. And Vail took it one step further um, and they actually used the same method for doing um, uh, the, the Python um, you know, encrypted executables. They also have I think a C1 now and a couple other ones which are nice. But what they do that, that is what Seth does is it encrypts all the data that, that would be considered malicious. So instead of encoding, you're encrypting. And then using you know, a dynamic cipher key, which is what SET uses. This is what I implemented like five years ago in SET. So what SET does is it, every time that you do shellcode, for example, it, never, it doesn't drop a binary at all. There's no binary whatsoever. But what happens is 
you know, the shell code gets encrypted with an AES-256 bubble with a dynamic cipher key, and then that decryption happens on the fly in memory. So those are the best options because encoding is, is something that someone's going to be able to figure out, decode it, write a signature for it, unless you're, you know, doing something polymorphic, which even that, like, if you look at Chicago Guy Nate, that was supposed to be a polymorphic engine, but they found static signatures within that um, that got flagged, uh, specifically with rewrite options inside the um, inside that PE file. So for me, it's all about encrypting, just keeping it encrypted and not having to worry about anything else on it. I haven't seen that work probably for five years. Really? Yeah. Uh, using Chicago Guy Name multi encoding, like doing multiple times, and you can also use what's called templates. And the templates um, are uh, taking a legitimate executable and then piggybacking your motion code on there. Even that gets flagged now. It's been getting flagged for a while. So I haven't, I haven't seen any success uh, with that in about five years. And the reason why I know that is uh, within set originally, that's what I was using uh, for, for using multiple different types of encoding. I did analysis on all of the different types of encoding and multiple encoding methods and then you know, you know, changing signatures and everything else in there. And all of them get flagged now, so I'd be, you know, I'd be surprised to see if it still got hit today. Um, so I'd recommend probably using if you're if you're not going to use something custom, either going with something that's pre canon set or Veil or something like that. There's a new framework that came out. I can't remember the name of it. If you see me afterwards, this thing looks completely badass. It actually mangles the executable, redirects execution flow to malicious code, and then uses it all in an encrypted format. So that allows you to inject into legitimate uh, PEs. But anyways, <clears throat> let me show you this real quick. So we use social engineering, tool, uh, social engineering tools. We're going to go to the website attack vector. Uh, we're going to go to the job applet attack method. And then we're going to clone a website. Now I'm going to clone just trustsec.com as an example. You can clone any website you want to. So what this is going to do is it's going to reach out, it's going to pull a website back, clone it. It's going to inject all the malicious code into it. It's going to do a dynamic cipher key, AES encrypt it. And I also do like weird stuff too to mess with people. Like I'll base 64 code it and rot it, rot it a couple times, just like random intervals. So like now you have to like, on base 64 encode it and then find the dynamic cipher key and then decrypt it and then they look at the memory now. So no one's gonna give I mean, no one's gonna do that. So, you know, here um, what it'll do is it'll do it. Now what I would do is if I'm targeting a company, I would look at like a benefits website or you know something that, that's legitimately on the outside of their perimeter, and then I would clone something differently, and then I would send a fish that looks legitimate. In this case, I'm only gonna do something like trusttech.com. And I'm gonna use an IP address just as an example, but I would have a domain name that's similar registered to it you know, like benefits-trustdesec.com or something legitimate. And I'll tell you about defeating the hover here in the next example. Um, but in this case, we'll just clone trustdesec. Now, what's interesting is with Java 7 update 42, they disallowed self-signing certificates, okay? Which means that you're not allowed to use self-signing certificates. Now, there's two ways of defeating that. One is you tell the user just lacks your security settings so that you can allow it because it's not compatible with our new systems. That works well. Um, or you buy a code signing cert. Now, to get a code signing cert is very easy. You just um, register what's called a doing business ads or a DBA. It's like 20 bucks, and then from there you buy a code signing cert, which is like 200 bucks, and you can be a DBA as whatever you want to. Like, I can be doing business ads, this is secure, please trust me. Or, hey, this is not malware, please click me. You can be doing business whatever you want to. So then the publisher will be anything you want it to be. Like, I own verified publisher, I own like this app was secure and signed, uh, this has been verified to be legit. Like, I own like a whole bunch of DBAs, and just like a dime a dozen. Just go buy as many as you want, and then go buy a couple kind of code signing service. Um, then here, uh, so we have a couple options. Now, when I, if, I'm using, if I'm using set, I'm going to use either the pie injector or the multi-pie injector. Those are the two best options, in my opinion, in set. The multi-pie injector is nice because it allows you to um, try to tunnel out multiple ports. So, for example, if I have egress filtering, I may allow 22, 21, 53, 25, 80, 4, 3, 80, 80, you know, maybe a couple of those ports, right? But I don't know which one that, that you have open. So if I'm going to go over 8443, I'm going to go over HTTP and HTTPS, which you can specify in here. Uh, if I'm going to go over FTP, I'm going to emulate FTP. If I'm going to go over you know, DNS, and emulate DNS. So you can, you can basically have it shoot out multiple ports here. And then when the payload hits, it's going to shoot out multiple shells out those different ports until you find one that's legit. So it allows you to, to, to go out multiple ports because I know that you have one egress rule that's going to allow me outbound, unless you're super tight. So I'll just select 15, just to pie injector as an example, we'll go over 443. And I'll use an interpreter versus TCP. And this is going to set everything up for you. It's going to create the web server. It's going to automatically copy everything. It's going to inject into the new profile. It's going to create the applet for you. It's going to use a dynamic cipher key. It's going to encrypt all that with AES. And it's going to base 64 randomize a little bit just to mess with people. And then on top of that, we're all set and ready to go. Now we've got our site. Okay? 
Now, what I'm going to do next is on my Windows uh, 7 machine or Windows 8 machine, I'm going to go to this website. And again, this is with Emmet and antivirus and all that good junk, right? Because that's all going to help. So I go to the website, and I can make the top name, obviously, look whatever I, is, I want to, okay? <laughs> so the name can be whatever you want, all right? The publisher is what's static now. So, you know, when you're doing a, doing a DBA or whatever, just make it whatever you want to. Like, something that's going to look legit. Like, I like something like, this applet has been verified. That's a great DBA, right? So people are going to trust that. Or, this publisher is trusted. Or, trusted publisher. Or, verified publisher. Right? All of those are all legit DBAs, right? And those all work great. If you saw that, if you saw a trusted publisher or something on there, and this is a, something that got sent from your corporate email, would you believe this? Heck yes. Anybody here that says no or are lying to themselves? You know, you can make this be a WebEx you know, portion. You can do WebEx meetings because WebEx still uses Java apps. You can do whatever you want to this stuff. It's very creative. <clears throat> and again, this isn't using any type of exploit. This is how Java is designed to work, right? So we hit run. What will happen next is it redirects back to the legitimate site. So after I've cloned it and I compromise them and it, it, it detects that I've actually uh, compromised them, it redirects them back to the legitimate website. So now they're actually at trustedsec.com. They're not at a malicious site anymore. So they don't know they were compromised. And now since I'm using all this stuff, now by the way, this I'm at detected. Um, that's uh, called certificate pinning. Everybody disables that because it's a pain in the butt to manage. But this would be fine if I had a legitimate certificate on that good stuff, up, okay? So over here, we got our shells, and we're good to go, right? We have access to our computers, and it was that easy. I mean, how long did that take me to set up? So I was talking a whole bunch, maybe a couple minutes. So that's a good one. And my next one is defeating hovers. I love hovers. I'm going to do what's called webjacking. This was originally introduced by White Sheep and Mgen into set, which is awesome, and it's been redesigned and rewritten in version six. A little history lesson there. And I'll just do something simple like accounts.google.com because it has a login. But it could be anything you want to. <clears throat> Make sure I got internet connection here. Oh, there we go. All right, ready to go. Again, it took me a while to, to make that I know. Okay, so here's what I would normally do in this type of scenario, okay? I would find a benefits website, I'd make the benefits website look legit, right? And it'd be like info-companyname.com or something like that. I'd send an email to the people, and it looks legit. Inside the actual web page, I would say, listen, you're about to enter some sensitive information. Please hover over this link to make sure that it is valid and legit. Right? Make sure it's going to a trusted sec resource, because if it's going to a trusted sec resource, you know it's legit, right? <clears throat> so make sure it's, for one, make sure it's HTTPS. And make sure it's going to benefits.trustedsec.com. All right. So if I hover over this link right here, this works on IE, you know, eight, uh, you know, four or five, six, seven, eight, ten, eleven, or whatever version they're in. Firefox, you know, Chrome, everything else is all good to go. I think Opera too, but I've never tested it because I don't think people still use Opera. But um, anyway, <clears throat> so if you click on that, what does that say down there? Is legit? You're all like, no. But I wouldn't have said that if, you know, anyways. <clears throat> so you have to roll that and it says like, HTTPS, not doing any funky things here, HTTPS colon forward forward slash accounts.google.com. Legit. Right? It's good to go, right? We're all, we're all feel good. And then again, this is just a template. I would make it look beautiful and everything. I was actually doing a real SE. So <clears throat> you click that link, and what's going to happen? We should go to accounts.google.com, right? Well, technically, we do. So we're going to briefly go to accounts.google.com. Our, our machine is going to contact out and make requests on accounts.google.com. But then if you notice the URL bar real quick, and again, I have a domain name and things like that that make it look more legit. But we're going to do a quick switcheroo, all right, without any user interaction. Ready? So I'm going to click. Ready? Click. Click. Where am I at? Accounts.google.com. Quick switcheroo. All right. Username, password. And everybody using a password redirects back to the legitimate site and everybody that they were there. And then, so that was the last one here. Sorry. See, so username and password? So that's what I earned a username and password. 
So no trick or anything, it's just how browsers are designed to work. And what's great about this stuff is I, I love, so I used, to get, I used to get really heavy into exploit dev and stuff like that, which has been great. I love doing exploit dev, it's a big puzzle. But the problem is when you find a zero day, and I've, you know, we found a lot of those, you find those, and then you disclose them, and then they're fixed, and you can't use them anymore. What's nice about how features are designed to work, if you can abuse those, you either have an extremely long shelf life or forever shelf life. So if you can abuse how things are designed to work, like Java, for example, or browsers, we have these forever. No one's going to fix this. So now we have these forever, and we can use these for our attacks going forward, and no one's going to patch it, which is great. The Java stuff, I mean, I've been talking about the Java stuff for like eight years. It's not going to change. Primarily because, personally, Java and security doesn't, anyways, not good. So pretty cool demos, huh? Neat? Okay. So here's some things to ponder to fix it. Education awareness is obviously a key factor. Two-factor authentication is one. Uh, is anybody here a two-factor authentication enable? Anybody ever use phone factor? Don't raise your hand. Anybody ever use phone factor? I'm going to make fun of phone factor all the way here in just a second. So phone factor is great because what phone factor does is when I log in with the username and password, let's just say in that attack I harvested the username and password, right? Now what's going to, what's going to happen next after I authenticate my username and password? Send a text, right? And it's going to say, are you logging in right now to Outlook Web Access? And there's a, there's a little link there for yes or no, right? So you hit, you hit the link that says yes, or you hit the link that says no. What is a user going to do 99.99999% of the time? Yes. yes. So the past five pen tests I've been on with Phone Factor, you know how many times I've been successful? All five times. Like literally, I'm like, oh, the first time it happened, by the way, I'm like, oh, I'm sweating. I'm like, I get in, it's like, hey, we just sent a text message. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna get busted. And then I got logged in all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like maybe they didn't, didn't implement Phone Factor right or something. I'm like, well, I don't know. Second pen test, I'm like, log me in again. The, the hell? And then you realize these people are just hitting yes. If a normal user gets a, are you logging in? I'm sure I'm logging in somewhere. My phone's probably logging in right now, I'm sure. Yes. Poor implementation of two-factor authentication. If you give the user the power to error, they will error. RSA was great. I mean, I, you can say whatever you want to about them as a company, you know, or whatnot, but their security stuff was great because they actually had to manually type in that number. They had a hard token that they had to manually enter a number. You can't mess that up. Well, you can. I mean, if I call, like, hey, what's your number on the thing? They're like, oh, it's this, this, and this. But it takes a little more work, right? But it's a little bit less believable, okay? So make sure your two factor is, is implemented appropriately, okay? That users can't mess up. Yeah. Well, I've actually found that, I mean, when you when you leave your desk, I, I know plenty of people that I work with leave their phone at their desk. Absolutely. So, so when you get a text message, yep. you even have the, the preview thing you can press start on the phone. And, See, see the actual text message? If people are doing preview, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I know that's what Google does. Yeah. yeah. Mine doesn't. No. <laughs> that's a good, good point. I mean, you have a couple of ways of doing it. So two-factor isn't necessarily an end-all be-all. Obviously, up-to-date software. Has anybody ever heard of uncategorized sites before? Yes. These are awesome. Block these. If they're not categorized, just block them. You know how much, you know how much you know, phishing site that's going to stop you from? Like 90% of what you get. Because what happens with uncategorized sites, whether you're using ScanSafe or Blue Code or whatever the heck you're using, they have this field called either uncategorized or unclassified sites. And these are sites that haven't registered themselves in any way, shape, or form, or haven't been profiled. In most cases, it can give out false positives. So you will have sites that are supposed to be you know, categorized or not categorized appropriately. You have to be able to put that in your process. Hackers don't spend the time to categorize sites unless you're like us and a couple other folks. You know, we'll spend time to categorize our sites. But you know, in most cases, these don't have anything on them, like, you know, like, like most of them, like 90% of them are going to be uncategorized. So you block this, you're literally blocking like 90% of the stuff up there. Um, least restriction possible, no administrative users, obviously. Um, the enhanced mitigation toolkit I'll talk about in a second. Altillery is an open source tool that is an active honeypot. So it's up like basically sensors that have fake ports on it that give you information back and forth that look legit. And then from there it gives you advanced notifications, another open source project. So Emmet's interesting. Has anybody not heard of Emmet before? Good, we've all heard of Emmet, go. So the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit um, is a way of basically blocking a lot of the zero-day techniques. Um, as, a, as a person that writes exploits, there's a number of techniques that I use to get around preventative measures in Windows. So you have what's called ASLR, Edge of Space Layer Randomization, or Data Execution Prevention, or DEF, you know, uh, Structure and Exception Handlers, SEH. There's a lot of different, uh, no, state SEH. So there's a lot of different techniques to stop exploits that are built into Microsoft, okay? But all of those are bypassable 
based on different types of, of methods. Like this one is called ROP gadgets or return oriented programming, where basically you, you, know, you trigger an exploit, but you're not actually executing anything on the stack because you then trigger data execution prevention. So you use bits and pieces in memory to pull and assemble your little code here that then returns back to your code, and then eventually you can get around data execution prevention. It's a pain in the butt, but it works. So what Microsoft has done is they've created a tool that, that literally tries to look for a lot of these predefined patterns that people use, like return rates of programming attacks. There's, I think, six protection mechanisms in there or something. Um, and so it tries to look at how exploits work, like heap sprays and you know, memory corruption flaws and you know, buffer overflows. And it takes that and it stops a lot of them. This thing is free. It's going download. Emmet 4.1. Going download. Now there's a 5.0 tech preview that's out right now. So the version 5.0 should be uh, released soon. But it literally stops. Like, if you look, take all of the exploits right now that are inside of Metasploit, except for Java ones, because it's again, Java is just designed to suck. So those are sandbox escapes and they don't necessarily protect against Emmet. But all the other normal exploits, like IE exploits and stuff like that, it stops them all today. And don't get me wrong, there's ways of bypassing Emmet. All right, Jared DeMott did some really good talk and uh, research on, on how to bypass it. And then recently, sick, uh, Sickness from uh, Offensive Security um, showed how to basically just disable Emmet within the process. And then from there, you can execute your code. So there are ways of bypassing Emmet. And they, they're not that hard to do. But as an attacker, I have to build that into the exploit I'm targeting. So if you have Emmet in place, it's another layer that you have in defense. It makes it a lot harder for me as an, ex an exporter, especially pre-canned exploits that come out, to get around it. Here's a... a, a, a um, uh, zero that came out, and this is uh, courtesy of Spider Labs, the research on this one. And you can see here that it actually checks for the Emmet DLL. Well, it was the first exploit that ever checked for the Emmet DLL. You know what it did when it found the Emmet DLL? It stopped. Didn't run the exploit. Just disabled itself. Not going to run. Not going to mess with it. So it's great stuff. Now, don't get me wrong, attackers are going to build Emmet capabilities into there, and it's going to happen. But again, it introduces more and more complexity into it. And guess what? Microsoft's continually looking at ways of bypassing Emmet, and they're building into the new releases. So the 5.0 tech preview stops the method that I'm about to explain here. It's a method that Sigrix came out with um, on how to bypass uh, um, uh, Emmet 4.1. And basically, it's, 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 it's really simple. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, don't get me wrong, Sigrix did a lot of great work on the research on it. It's complex. But the method is, is, is simple. I mean, basically, you, you, you look for the base address of the Emmet DLL, and then you zero that out, and then now the Emmet DLL is not running. So, that basically gets you around all the Emmet protections in that specific process. Again, it's fixed in 5.0, or 5.0 tech review fixes that issue. But again, it's always going to be a different battle back and forth on whether or not you can fix this or not. Now, there's two deployment methods that I recommend. There's the group policy method deploying it. And then my favorite one is, um, uh, is using file shares, like I under sysfile shares, and using scheduled tasks to do policy updates. Because you get more granularity within the XML than you do group policy. Group policy doesn't support for Emmet, it blows. It sucks. So I would really recommend going with more of the file share deployment uh, via schedule task. You want some more information, just asking. I'm running out of time here. So uh, how much time do I have left? Like? Yeah, you got 10 minutes. All right, So talking about fixing stuff, um, we should move away from the 1990s frame of, of attack of teaching people education words. I mean, literally, the stuff we're talking about is when this show was on. Is that Beverly Atlantic 2.0, right? That and Stay by the Bell, my two favorite shows when I was a kid, right? Um, so we're, we're teaching people like the Zach Morris way of, of, of protecting against attacks today. That's what our current posture is for education awareness. We have to shift that to, to do things that people can relate to, people that can understand things personally and relate that back to work. Um, when I was at Diebold, you know, I, my, my number one program wasn't vulnerability management. It wasn't monitoring attack. Well, monitoring attack was probably my number one. They're, they're close. Education awareness is minor protection from your life. Anyways, so education awareness was key, and I had people dedicated to just giving education awareness out there. And you know what happened when I started teaching people education awareness and it was working? Implementing things in the company was ridiculously easy. Like, working with IT was ridiculously easy. Working with the business was ridiculously easy. Like, I sent out a whole email to the entire company and said, hey, just so you know, every time you access VPN in all day, it's going to be two-factor authentication. It's, it's happening on Sunday. We had two calls. Company, global company, 20,000 employees, two calls. That's awesome, right? That type of stuff you don't get to do unless you are able to communicate to the organization of why you're doing it and why it's effective. And people really understand, like, Hartley was a great example. Kudos to the security industry in Hartley, because we got our name out there, we showed them the force, we had patches that were communicating. Those type of things resonate with people. I mean, those people that, that, that are like, literally like, have no idea what technology is asking about Hartley, right? That was beautiful. We need more of those. We need more. No, 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 no. 
Well, we don't get any, don't get me wrong, okay? We don't need more of those. Yeah, we do. We need more. We need more of those, all right? So introduce some more flaws in there, NSA. Um, <clears throat> so we need those things to communicate. We have to relate to people. For me, the most critical security program isn't owner management and penetration testing compliance. It's really just education awareness. You have to invest in education awareness. You have to do it. That is the most important part of a security program, period, to me, other than minor detection, those two. So if you look at building out a program, you can go two ways. Ruth Schneider doesn't necessarily agree that education awareness is effective or works. I would completely disagree with them because I built a security program in a company that had no security. And I built a education awareness program that worked inside of a company that didn't have one before so I can see the direct results. Education awareness works. You just have to do it right. Okay? Step one, <clears throat> uh, support group. You know, first, first you have to get the support in order to sell education awareness. That's, coming from your executives and all those areas, and you have to communicate why you're doing it and why it's important. Now, things like monthly newsletters uh, kind of work sometimes, but uh, again, mostly related like the Target Breach or Parkly, things like that that you can relate to people. We did things where we monitored like pay spins and um, you know breach notification stuff, and we'd associate names with people in the company, and then we'd send emails to them saying, hey, just so you know, you know, X was just compromised, and you have an account on there, you might want to you know change your password, make sure it's not the same anywhere else. Like helping people out personally, right? Hey, you know, make it a thing for your security team. If your home computer gets infected, bring it in. Our security team will look at it and, and fix it for you. Those things work. Like people, I, I was up at like I was up at like two o'clock in the morning as a CSO of a Fortune 1000 company, fixing someone's computer. But guess what? That person is now loyal forever, forever and ever and ever. They will help you no matter what, whether it's your son's machine or whomever. They will do whatever they possibly can to make sure that you're successful. It works. Two. Um, if you build it, they will come. You know, relate again. Relate. I, I picked this a lot. Quarterly newsletters, videos to me work best. We did funny videos and skits and stuff like that. I mean, things that people could like look at and just learn quick information. It's only like five minutes long. Things that are easy. Podcasts are good. We did a podcast. Got in trouble for that. Um, anyways, um, test the program. You know, uh, that's that's really going in and testing whether or not your technology and your program is working. It's a continual effort, seeing whether or not you get it, all that good stuff. Um, step number four. Um, you know. I can't emphasize enough, if it's on their mind, they will do it. And so if you're teaching people how to protect themselves at home, or you're teaching people how to relate that to business, they will do it if they see it. So I'd rather have 20,000 sensors in my company versus zero, or just a security team running everything. It doesn't work. Let me ask a question. Does anybody here have enough staffing for the security program? People laugh, right? Laughing off the stage. Do people here have enough funding for the security program? Let me ask a question, percentage-wise, what are you compared to IT? People laugh again, right? Like 1%, 5%, 10% maybe? So you have all of these things moving at uh, all the time, right? So you have people, does, does anybody here know every single IT project that's going on right now? People laugh again, right? There's no way to do it. Not that, so you take that into consideration. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough staff, anything else. And now we're focusing on trying to like put controls in and you know, change control and stuff and all these other things. And we have a whole user population here that can probably detect most of it for us. I'd rather focus on that than everything else because we don't have the people to do it right. Now, if I had a thousand people and a thousand IT people, it'd be a good world because I could just have one person assigned to one person every time they're doing something. Like, nope, can't do it. Nope, can't do it. Not going to work, right? Businesses aren't going to do that. Um, so that's really um, that. I just want to show you some cool stuff really quick before I wrap up. Um, I built, and you may have seen my GPU cracker yet. You may have seen that one. So anybody know about GPU cracking and all that good stuff? You know, you can mathematically computate things a lot faster using graphic processors than you can you know, using a normal processor. So a normal processor, you might get, you know, let's just say I'm using, you know, the latest and greatest Mac. I might get maybe a thousand password attempts per second, whereas with graphic processors, it's exponential. So um, I just built a new GPU cracker. I just wanted to show everybody because I'm excited about it. Um, this is my fourth time building a GPU processor, and it's gotten a lot better uh, through time progress. So I just want to show you my evolution of building GPU processors from when it was really horrible to what we have today. So here's my second attempt. I don't have any pictures of my first attempt, uh, unfortunately. That was even worse. Um, here's my, 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 my second attempt. You notice here it's you know cores everywhere. I had two different uh, uh, power units because uh, we, we kept prime name is a long, long story. This thing here wouldn't go in, so I ended up cutting my finger and dripping blood over the motherboard. I had to go take the motherboard back, and it's hard to explain why there's blood on the motherboard. Um, 
And then you can notice here these are all really close together, so from a heating perspective, it's just not good, uh, not a good idea. Third attempt, um, that was my third attempt. So that was uh, four, or, I'm sorry, eight GTX uh, 590 Fermi chipsets. Um, and that was a couple years back. That was a good design, I thought. You know, they look the airflow and everything. The casing is, is, is uh, normal, but the, everything else is all what I designed from there. And then our latest attempt, now, <clears throat> mind you, when I did this latest attempt, okay, I wanted to go bay or, you know, go home, right? But what was funny about it is once we were building it, we got it all up and running. There's a guy and myself were building this, guy, and a guy named Paul Koblitz. We're sitting there building it and everything. And um, we're like, all right, listen, fun, fun challenges. We like to do fun things at, at Trusted Sec. I'm like, all right, none of us can pee until Ubuntu is loaded on here. It took us 11 hours to load Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get it loaded for one. We were like, at, towards like the 10th hour, we're like, listen, for the love of God, work. Work. We're all like, you know. <laughs> So, um, and what it, what it turned out ended up, be, ended up being is, uh, you know, for some reason I decided to put a DVD burner in there. No idea why. Does anybody ever still use DVDs anymore? Or would you ever use it on a password cracking rig? No, but it, I just decided to put it in there because I was going big or going home, right? As soon as I unplugged the damn power from the DVD thing, it worked fine. It took 11 hours to figure out. Worst day ever. Still haven't recovered. And here's our, last, our latest one. So this is uh, four R9 290Xs, liquid cool. And so in this configuration, we can run them completely overclocked as max as it can go. Um, um, and uh, basically, they'll stay at about 59 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. And um, what's nice about this is that you can really run them to about, uh, to about 100 to 104. So we don't even get to any tor anywhere near its max temperature. So we can run these all day long um, and, and without a problem at all. They stay perfectly cool. So I've got a couple of screenshots of it. <laughs> Beautiful. Of course, you have to have neon lights. So um, some of the specs, the 32, uh, 32 gig Corsair dominators, you don't really need much on the RAM side. Uh, uh, CD type terabytes, uh, two terabytes, uh, Barracudas, again, you don't need much space in that uh, because you're going to be loading most of it into memory. What was important is uh, the motherboard. So I went with the Asus Rampage um, 4 Black. And the reason for that is it has the double wide SLI, uh, the PCI Express slots, and the double wide and there's four of them. So in order to put four you know, them on there with all the lipid cooling and everything else, we needed that. Um, and then I did four AMD Radeon R1990Xs. Uh, liquid cool and then just a 1500 watt uh, power supply. What's interesting is I blow my uh, 20 amp circuit, so you think you need more than 20 amp circuit. Um, so if you like run it for a really long time, it could blow the circuit. So we had to get a uh, 40 amp circuit put in uh, just to handle it. But I wouldn't think for 1500 watts you'd do that. I'm not an electrician guy. So I don't know. Um, so we're cracking 92.3 billion passwords per second. Um, and so your normal, your normal process can get about 1,000. You get 92.3 billion. So it cracks an eight character password in two seconds, nine character password in less than 20 minutes. Um, what's nice is, um, has anybody messed with OCL hash cat? Great guy, Martin Boss, who I probably gave a talk on it last year. The, you know, cracking passwords is a methodology. Like you have to understand what you're doing with rules and everything else. We cracked a 27 character password last week using rules. It's like amazing. Like what are the chances of that happening, you know? Um, so, I mean, when you get into this, it isn't necessarily about brute forcing anymore, brute forcing the landscape. It's how fast you can do it. Has anybody ever messed with uh, Responder? If you haven't, check it out. Uh, it's from uh, what Spider Labs, uh, writes Responder. Um, and basically, it's a way of, of um, getting uh, net NTLM hashes on the wire without having to do anything crazy. And then uh, what's nice about that is you can run that through OCL and it cracks the password. So, like, every pen test now is just like, run that, crack that, okay, I'll try to grab this too. You know, so there's a lot of other ways of getting um, password hashes and cracking them really quick, and that's why these things definitely pay off. Do we have any questions? Your brain's hurt? A lot of information in an hour? All right, well, I appreciate you having me on here. Thanks very much.